I am Franco Moretti. I'm a literary historian and literary theorist. I've taught uh, comparative literature in, uh, in Italy and the US and eventually in Switzerland, where I now live with my family. And uh, I don't teach anymore, but I'm a permanent fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg. And in the course of my research, I've basically followed uh, uh, two main uh, paths of, uh, of work. Uh, one, which is the most recent one, uh, the last 20, 25 years, not so recent, um, has to do with the, the desire, the attempt to introduce uh, uh, quantitative and uh, loosely speaking scientific methods within the study of literature and of uh, culture more broadly. This goes under a variety of names that you may have heard, digital humanities, computational criticism, distant reading, the names don't matter. What matters are the two or three main uh, ideas, main issues behind the attempt. The first is uh, quite simple, um, especially in literature, but I think in other fields of the humanities as well. We have basically constructed our disciplines by studying a very, very thin slice of the literature that was actually written and uh, published. 1%, maybe even less than 1% for certain periods, certainly much less than 1% today. And uh, the advent of digital archives and of computational uh, tools suddenly allows us to enormously broaden our field of inquiry. So uh, the first reason to try and do this was to try and chart what at times has been called the great unread, which now we can not exactly read, at least uh, um, analyze uh, uh, in a variety of ways. Broader cultural history, whether broader will also mean different remains to be seen. This is work that has started recently and the uh, results so far are well mixed, but certainly was worth uh, trying. Second uh, main reason is that even leaving aside these large new archives that have become possible, even when we read a single text, a novel, a play, what I mean, most communication doesn't have to be literary, in fact. We usually focus on uh, very few important words and construct our understanding around them. And this makes perfect sense, but it is not the only way in which meaning is constructed. And perhaps it is not always the most effective way. There's also another way in which meaning uh, becomes, um, uh, is conveyed, and that is not through the very few very important words, but the very frequent, apparently invisible words. The, in, of, articles, pronouns. Uh, and here, the meaning is constructed by very small changes in frequency of these words. Uh, this may sound very, and then we are not capable of following such uh, small uh, shifts in frequency. This may sound very abstract, let me give you an example of so a project that actually started at uh, Vico in 2013. I met a French sociologist, Dominique Pestre, and uh, we studied together the um, yearly reports of the World Bank. Not the greatest literature, but uh, interesting. And we realized that there was a very strange, significant change in the frequency of the most boring word in uh, language, which is the conjunction and. But anyway, this changed uh, um, quite significantly. We constructed an argument around this, not only this, but largely. This made it into the World Bank itself. It created a big kerfuffle, uh, eventually led to the resignation of their chief economist, which was you know, completely unexpected. Um, it doesn't always go that far, but at times in these tiny changes of tiny words lies a world of significance that only becomes possible if you start studying, you know, uh, with that approach, which, as I said at the beginning, is loosely speaking, scientific and so on. 
Well, this has been my most recent uh, self, so to speak. But alongside this, I've always continued to do what I was uh, trained to do, what most literary historians are trained to do. That is to say, take literature, literary texts, as, uh, um, uh, as a kind of message. Again, many messages work like this, but literary messages a little more than, than say, this video, for instance take literary texts as uh, messages that don't really mean what they say. Their real meaning has to be dug out. They require an interpretation. An interpretation which is a transformation. This really means that. This is that. This is what we're trained to do. Um, uh, many of you who will be looking at this video are uh, natural scientists, and uh, I'm sure you're, uh, uh, you immediately notice the danger in treating data in such a cavalier, uh, or what may look like a cavalier way. Um, but this is something we do. I've continued to do it, um, mostly on European literature, Western European, German, French, English, especially Italian to a certain extent the novel mostly from roughly the French Revolution to World War I. This is also what I'm uh, uh, right now, right this coming year at the Vico, uh, going to work on, that is to say uh, tragic form, an interpretation of tragic form, which to me is uh, interesting, uh, again, mostly for two reasons. The first is that tragedy seems to be the one form, the one convention, the model, the little model, which our culture has found to represent the kind of conflict that goes to extremes, conflict to death. And of course, a form capable of capturing this kind of conflict, uh, simply for this reason, is worth investigating. But there's a second reason which makes it, um, in uh, uh, my eyes, uh, even more uh, striking, which is that, okay, a conflict between two enemies. Well, tragedy is the form that allows the enemy, even the enemy of the playwright, to speak, to have powerful arguments, and uh, to be listened to. The first, this is a coincidence, but it's a beautiful coincidence. The first tragedy we have, uh, Aeschylus Persians, is a Greek tragedy. There isn't a single Greek. Uh, the, all the characters on scene are members of the Persian Empire that had tried to annihilate Greece, the enemies par excellence. And yet, you know, the tragedy, of course, the tragedy then says all sorts of good things about the Greeks. Uh, that's inevitable. But still, the capacity to get, it's unimaginable today. Uh, and this also is a very interesting fact, how we have lost what seemed to be the possibility of uh, granting the enemy a powerful, um, uh, a powerful way of uh, speaking and being forced to actually listen to these reasons. So, two paths, two souls to some extent, um, quantitative, interpretive, and for quite a while I've thought, okay, I'll, one day I or someone else will find a synthesis between them. And uh, this, um, well, I'm less convinced uh, uh, of that now than I was five or 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, the last colloquium, Tuesday colloquium I gave at the Vico in the spring of 19 was uh, precisely on this, on the difficulty of uh, joining the two, of synthesizing the two approaches. Personally, I, you know, okay, synthesis are always lovely, they're elegant, they're uh, economical, but even to approaches that can't be brought to an agreement and that keep challenging each other is also it's not a bad way to generate um, new ideas. Anyway, whether with a synthesis or with an endless challenge, there's probably no better place 
to pursue this kind of reflection than the one where you are now and where I hope to be often in the course of the year.